Welcome to TCT Alive. My name is Paul Kendall, and I'm the family pastor at Winston-Salem First in beautiful North Carolina. And I'm so happy to be your host today because we have a program that combines my passion, which is family, and something that's very, very pervasive in families today that I'm sure most of you are dealing with, and that's some form of addiction and how it affects the whole family. And we have uh, the person that is, in my opinion, the best of the best to address this topic. It's Jeff Van Vonderen. You've probably seen him on the A&E award-winning program called Intervention. You may have seen him on Oprah. He's an interventionist, a counselor. He understands all of these things. He's an author. And uh, we have a lot of information to get through today. So I want you to join me in welcoming none other than Jeff Van Vonderen. Thank you, Paul. All right, you've been on the program with us before, and we talked about addiction specifically itself, but today I want to cover the topic of, of how addiction affects not only the addict, but others uh, in, in the family. And, and to start off, I think it would be helpful for everybody that's watching just, to just understand how that happens in the first place, and, and the best is your definition of a family system. How, how would you describe that? Well, a system is a group of interrelated, interdependent parts, which means that what affects one part affects all the parts. Even if you can't see it happening, that, that's what happens. So Paul talks about that in Corinthians when he says, when one member suffers, all suffer with it. So he doesn't go, all could suffer, all should suffer. He says, when one suffers, all suffer. That's how, how systems work. Mm -hmm. the human body is a system made up of systems. You hit your finger, your knees buckle. You don't go, huh, how shall I deal with this? Your knees buckle, you get tears because everything's affected. Right. Winston-Salem school system, parents, teachers, cooks, bus drivers, students. Right. Bus drivers stay home. Parents are affected because they have to now give rides mm -hmm. that yesterday they didn't have to give. So when I say a family system, I just mean a group of interrelated, interdependent parts where one member affects all the m members. Right. Okay. Now, with addiction, <clears throat> if you love somebody who's addicted, and actually it doesn't even have to be in your own family, but if, if you love somebody who's addicted, right. if you care about them, you're, you're in their system. Right. Even if you aren't in their family system, you're in their system of people that love them. Okay? It's like watching somebody that you love up on a tightrope, and it's horrifying, you know, because they're up on a tightrope, plus they're using, so they're not even a good tightrope walker. Okay, mm -hmm. and then you have other things going on in your life, like life. That's all horizontal stuff. Right. Job, family, church, hobbies. Okay, but even when you're trying to do all this stuff, you're still thinking about or talking about or worried about or trying to figure out the guy in the tightrope. So basically, intrudes into your life, even if you're not watching it firsthand. Right. You can be in Texas getting phone calls, but you're still worried about the guy in the tightrope. So you know, well, then they slip and fall. That's the latest crisis, or the latest bad news, or the latest scary thing, or the latest I need money, or the latest... Right. But somehow they always manage, manage to catch themselves, right. and they pull themselves back up again. Mm -hmm. Or because people that love them don't want them to fall, yeah. they push them back up by giving them help that just keeps them living on the tightrope where we don't want them anyway. Mm. Now, see, I do interventions. When I do an intervention, I train the family, and it's a whole day process before we even meet with the addict and in my opinion that's the most important day right because we're going to know what we're going to say what we're not going to say who's going to say it, what order who's going to chase them if they run out the door i mean every single detail right so that the only thing that's missing is for them to agree to go to get help on the second day and if they do which they do about 95 percent of the time we're on the way to the place we have lined up ahead of time mm-hmm okay. and uh so we invite them to jump off the tightrope you know voluntarily into the net that we have waiting. Right. I can't tell you how many phone calls I get from people that say, we're going to do an intervention on our dad on Thursday. You know, and I say, well, what if he says yes? And they go, what? Mm. Well, what do you want him to say? Yes. Well, what if he does? And they don't have a net yet. A plan. And by the time they get the net, even if he says yes, which is rare, yeah. <coughs> by the time they make all the phone calls and all the arrangements, he got drunk and changed his mind, and nothing changes anyway. Wow. So the most important part is the time coming up to the intervention. Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously the intervention is, you know, important too. Right. Now, the thing is, though, that with addiction, the addict, you know, if you're using alcohol, uh, 
opiates, heroin, Vicodin, Oxycontin, you know, synthetic opiate, whatever. Mm -hmm. You get addicted to the substance, which means that if you don't have it, your body says, where is it? Right. And gives you some withdrawal or even death. Mm -hmm. okay. But with mood-altering substance, sometimes you get addicted to mood-altering, period. Okay. okay. Which means that um, that would be like pot. Big argument in our country about pot. <clears throat> You know, if you're, if you're addicted to pot and you stop using it, your body doesn't say, where's the pot? Your mood does. Okay. Okay. Same with gambling. <coughs> Excuse me. Same with any kind of, you know, that's what workaholism is. It's a mood addiction. Okay. okay? You're medicating your mood by working, overworking like that. Okay. All right. So what happens with families is the, uh, the addiction is a cycle. Mm -hmm. And the addict gets in a cycle. And, and so if you can picture a clock, at 12 o'clock is preoccupation. Preoccupation is, you know, I live in northern Wisconsin, and when it's 20 days in a row at 10 below in February, I start thinking about jet skiing someplace. Okay, now what you're describing now is the cycle of addiction. Of addiction. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think about jet skiing. That's not bad. That's what, you know, I'm borrowing pleasure from then to help me get through now. Right. Okay, but if you're sitting in my counseling office spilling your guts about your life and I'm looking at you thinking about jet skiing, well, then it's not okay. Mm, okay? Right. And that kind of preoccupation gets in the way of real things, you know. Okay, so uh, then there are also all rituals and routines that, uh, that the person develops. So, you know, you've seen the routine of a heroin addict if you ever watched a movie with a heroin addict. They have a kit, they take out a spoon and, a, you know, like that, and they put the thing. All right. Um, I like to fish and hunt, you know, so a week before the season I clean my rifle and then I take my long underwear out and then I take, make sure they still fit and I make sure there's no, you know, holes in my boot and then I, you know, go to some sporting goods store and buy junk I don't need like I did last year. Every year I do this. What I'm doing is I'm getting high on hunting and I didn't go yet. Okay. Okay, and people okay. do this with fishing and golfing and shopping and all kinds of things. But if it's fishing and shopping and golfing, is that bad? Unless it, if it gets in the way of your relationships. Okay. Yeah, if it has consequences like you're sitting in my office and I'm thinking about jet skiing. Right. Okay. Using, this is the bottom part of the cycle, is when the person actually is ingesting the mood-altering thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then when they're all done using and the, and the dust settles, they feel guilty or remorseful or depressed or whatever. So now we're at the bottom of the cycle. <coughs> right. Now we're up on the 9 o'clock. Okay. That's a low mood place. The quickest, easiest way to not be in the depressed guilt, whatever, this is where they are when they're not using. So that's why not using doesn't solve anything. Because when it says, okay, I won't use, all they're doing is telling you they're going to go to a non-mood altered place. Right. Okay, which is a low place. The quickest, easiest way to not be there is not to use. It's to think about using. Mm -hmm. Because they already mood alter anticipating using. And who are they going to call? And where are they going to get it? And see, so th there's a cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, families. Family members become as preoccupied with the addict mm. as the addict is with drugs and alcohol. So family members develop routines on how to deal with the addict. Which becomes their addiction. And so now how do we talk to them? How do we, not, how we tiptoe just right? How, right? how we don't tick them off so that they can blame us for using? Using for the loved ones? Mm-hmm. It's a mood-altering experience for loved ones of an addict just to talk about the addict. Either up, good news, he's right. breaking promises, looking good, trying hard, right. or he's breaking promises, he got arrested. You know. right. um, not only do family members use, they binge use. So they talk about it, talk about it, analyze, talk about it, and then they go, I'm exhausted. I'm not talking about, don't call me anymore. No more phone calls. So they're abstinent now. Right. Okay? And then the addict starts another fire. And the whole thing starts over again. So, so they become mood altered. They become mood addicted to the addict. So is that the, the phrase that we're familiar with, codependent? Yeah, codependent. I don't, I don't like the phrase because, you know, first of all, I don't think it's been described very well. Okay. And it certainly became trite in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Saturday, Saturday Night Live, Live oh. trashed it really big, you know, and Stewart saves his family and all that. Right. Okay. It just means that you become dependent on the dependent for how your how, how your mood is you get on a mood roller coaster 
with the dependent being your mood altering substance, just like the dependent gets on a mood roller coaster with the substance being their substance. So for the codependent, their drug of choice is the addict. And if they're doing good and trying hard, okay. So that's why they spend all this time trying to fix the addict, because if they, right. can, if they can just fix them, see, then when they're okay, right. I'll be okay. You understand that? Yes. Okay. Now, the problem with that is that, for instance, in, in John, in the book of John, Jesus is back, you know, and he asks Peter if, if you love him. Mm-hmm. If, do, you, do you love me? Three times, Peter gets frustrated, you mm-hmm. know. He says, Lord, you know I love you, and he says, feed my sheep. Then he says, um, when, you, when you were young, you, you wore whatever you want, went where, wherever you want, but right. when you get old, someone else is going to dress you and, and take you where you don't want to go. And he said this about um, how he would glorify the Lord. Right. Basically, get crucified upside down. Mm-hmm. Then he says, yeah. here's what's going to happen to you if you follow me, but follow me anyway. And Peter looks over here and says, well, what about him? <laughs> That's John. <laughs> yeah. And Jesus says, if I rem- let him remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me, which right. is to say... John and I is not your business. Right. Okay. You and I are your business. Right. And with the co-dependent family members, they're all worried about what's going to happen over here and trying to get God to fix this. And they lose their own dependence upon God and their own peace of mind and all this kind of stuff. They actually spend time praying that the real God would fix their false God. Wow. Wow. All right, so in my mind, I, I see this cycle with the addict and the family member. It's like the, the, the addicted person is, is out here ahead in their cycle, but the family member is maybe a half turn behind them. Yes, and in the center of the dependence cycle is the mood of the drug of choice. Okay. Alcohol, opiates, whatever, methamphetamine. Okay. Right. In the center of the circle for the codependent, I hate that term, okay, but well, codependent. What, what term would you rather use? Well, that's the term. I just ha- hate it because people always, it triggers, you know, weird definitions. Uh, because definitions of what society and, yeah. has done with okay. it. Okay, but in the middle of their cycle is the, their loved one. Yeah. And they're spinning around the loved one just the same way as the loved one is spinning around their mood-altering substance. Right. Okay, so to me... People, people who love an addict, uh-huh. they have a mood swing when the phone rings. Oh, Definitely, I've experienced yeah, it. As soon as, they, as soon as the phone rings, before they have to make sure, they have to see if it is, you know, the, the cops mm-hmm. or the coroner or the hospital right. before they even know how they're supposed to feel about feel. that phone call. Wow. That's how powerful of a drug that okay, the addict now, is for the family. Now add into the equation that I'm a Christian, right, and I'm supposed to try and help save the world. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we think that, that we're, we're the answer instead of Jesus. We're the ones that have to go and, and, and be the solution for somebody. So now I have a friend or family member that is on the in bottom, trouble. in yeah, trouble on the yeah. bottom of their cycle. They're calling me, I need $100 for a bus ticket, or I need to come stay with you, or I need help. And now I want to be the person to do my Christian work. Right, which I, be I don't a good mean Samaritan who's the light of that. There's, there's a truth to that, but there's also part of me that just thinks, okay, this is where I'm supposed to kick in and be Christ here. This is my Christian right. work. So now I've got to go and help this person. Yeah. So my knee-jerk reaction is to rush in and help <clears> him, <throat> go and rescue him, bring him into my house. Um, right. and, and then what I find out in time, like I'm sure so many people that are watching, is that all we've really done is help them go back into the next turn of that cycle again. Right, you push them up on the tightrope where you don't want them anyway. Yeah, see, the problem is that in the story, for instance, of the Good Samaritan, Right. Jesus holds up the Good Samaritan as the hero. Here's how to be. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, the thing is that addicts are looking for Good Samaritans. Okay. okay. So, so the key to sort through all this is ask yourself, does the person know they need help? About one out of 25 people that call me for, to do an intervention, help a family member, actually do anything. One in 25. So, really? But they all have sad stories. It's terrible. It's terrible. Crying. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. And I, and I go, wow, sounds terrible. Let's do something. And then they go, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Okay, well, then it's not that bad. Call me when it's that bad. Wow. Okay? So the question that you need to ask yourself about the person that you want to help is, do they know they need help? So let's go to the Good Samaritan story. Did the guy who's beat up and bruised and cut up in the ditch, know he, know his, knew, did he know he need, needed help? Mm-hmm. 
sir? Well, sure. Well, that means that if you help him, the help will help. So he picked him up, took him to the hotel, paid the bill, said, I'll come back and pay you the rest of the bill. Okay. Now, if you help somebody that doesn't know they need help, the help doesn't help. Mm. Okay. So the story of the prodigal son. He goes to his dad and basically he says, let's just operate the same as if you were dead in the first place. Mm. You know, give me the, my stuff. Right. Okay? Then he takes off and he wastes it with riotous living. I love that. He squanders it with riotous living. Okay. Right. And, okay. <clears throat> and then he ends up in the pig pen. Yeah. Now, this is a Jewish story. So this is bad for him. Mm-hmm. Okay? Fighting with the pigs for food. And then it says, and no one was giving him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, this sucks, I'm going home. Okay, right. so I don't think it's, a, it's a, like a coincidence that it says, and, when, and no one was giving him anything, and when he came to his senses. Right. That's bottom. He hit bottom there. Right. Now, if his dad would have called ahead and said, get my son a cushy job, he mm. wouldn't hit bottom. Right. If he would have covered all the credit card bills, he wouldn't hit bottom like that. Mm-hmm. So now there's an example of God doing bottom. Mm-hmm. In Isaiah 5, mm-hmm. it, you know, it says, let me tell you a story about a guy who owned a vineyard. A guy owns a vineyard on a fertile hill. He picks all the rocks out of it. He does the choicest vine, puts a tower in it, puts a wine vat in the middle of it so he doesn't even have to take the grapes off on some bumpy cart ride and bruise them up before they make wine. Right. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. Mm. Hmm. Then he says, now let me tell you about me and my vineyard. Yeah. And now we know that the guy who owns the vineyard is God, and we're basically we're, we're the vineyard. Right. Okay. What more could I have done than I haven't already done? I, I love this because God is scratching his head. He's going, I don't get it. But he doesn't answer it. He doesn't, he doesn't say, well, I, you know, if I would have just followed my Bible verses better, or if I had just been a better parent, they would have turned out. Right. He just leaves it hang. What, what more could I have done that I haven't already done? Right. I guess I'm not a very good God. He didn't say that. Mm. Why, when I, produ- when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce only worthless ones? No answer. Just a question. This is God actually wondering things. Right. Okay? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do with my vineyard. I'm going to take its hedge down. It will be trampled ground. I will not prune or hole it anymore. Briars will come up. I will tell the clouds to stop raining on it. Wow. Okay. Bad news for that vineyard. Mm-hmm. Okay. See, here's the thing. <clears throat> what God is saying is, I cannot stop you from doing this. Right. But I am not funding it anymore. Mm. I'm not helping this happen anymore. You want to go be an addict? I can't stop you from doing that, but I'm not paying your cell phone anymore. Wow. I'm not letting you live in my house rent-free above my garage anymore. I'm not, I'm not helping this happen. Okay. Bad news, bad news. Turn the page. Chapter 6, bad news. Chapter 7, bad news. Chapter seven, fourteen. Behold, a virgin will be with child, and we will call his name Emmanuel. Good news, see? But sometimes you just don't know how good the good news is until you hear how bad the bad, bad news bad is. News. So it's okay to say, you know, the bottom line message of an intervention, which is okay to even say as a parent when you're raising kids, is uh-huh. there's nothing I won't do to help you get better, right. but there's nothing I will do to help this continue anymore. I'm not doing this. So, so the key is to define the word help. Yes. And enabling, another one of those trigger words, you know, is unhelpful or harmful help with good intentions. Yes. You know, you've been helping this person for five years. Mm-hmm. Are they helped? Mm-hmm. Are you burned out? Mm. You know? Which are signs helpful of Helpful helps, helps. Right. Helpful help. Helps. Okay, I'm trying to help, but it's tiring me. It's very tiring for me. Oh, yeah. Seems like it never gets anywhere. But at the next turn of the cycle, so those are um, indications of an enabler. Would you say helping things happen you don't agree with? Say that again. Helping things happen that you don't agree with. You know, okay, look, do an intervention on somebody. The addict's living in the garage. Mm-hmm. They're paying a cell phone bill. Okay, so here's my question. Is there any other person on the planet in that condition that you would let live in your garage and pay their cell phone bill? No. no. So if you had a neighbor in that condition, would, could you live in your garage? No. Well, what about a friend in that condition? No. Well, what about a stranger? Well, certainly no. Well, what about an enemy? What if you had an enemy in that condition, would you put them up in your garage and pay their cell phone bill? No. Mm-hmm. Well, 
sons are supposed to be more safe, more responsible, more accountable than friends, neighbors, strangers, and enemies. But you have given your son a license to be less safe, accountable, responsible than an enemy. So you, 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 do you agree with that? No. no stop you, doing it. You've done the opposite. Uh, the opposite. Uh, of with what good you intentions. intended to do. With good intentions. These aren't bad people. These are people who really want to help, but all they're doing is helping the person live up on the tightrope. And you see, the reason I do interventions, uh-huh. one of the many reasons I do them, is because there's an intervention coming anyway. Right. And when that one comes, we have nothing to say anymore. The judge has the final say. Death has the fa- final say. You know, and the person or the person doesn't care what we have to say anymore. So let's do ours first and preempt that one while we still have something to say and while pe- that person still cares about what we have Before to say. Before the owner of the vineyard comes back. Yeah. Wow. Yep. All right. So now we've got uh, a good understanding of the cycle of the addiction itself. <clears throat> Uh, for the addict, we've got a good understanding of how we, as people who love and care for them, get sucked into that cycle and become a pseudo addict yeah. ourselves. Uh, now, our I've mo- just scratched the surface. I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah, we don't have an understanding of it. We, but you have a, a language to describe what's happening. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and so now we're 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 sucked into this, and we think we're helping. But we're doing more harm than good. So what is God's answer to this? How do we help this person that we care so much about? Well, you know, when I do the intervention with the person, the message that they get through the intervention Mm -hmm. is your health is the most important thing. Get honest or die. You you need to get honest or you're going to die. Your health is... But see, when I do the training for the intervention, and this is the same whether there's an addict or intervention, this is the same anyway. Mm -hmm. So if we were talking about your son doing an intervention on your son tomorrow, Mm -hmm. what I would tell you today is, Paul, your health is the most important thing. Hmm. You know, you, you are responsible to be a healthy man, a healthy Christian, a healthy dad, a healthy husband, a healthy whatever you are, mm-hmm. whether your son gets well or not. Okay. If you show up on God's doorstep and he says, hey, you know, how come you neglected your family all that time? And you said, and you said because my son was using dope, it ain't going to work. No. Okay. You are responsible to be a healthy person. In, in, in all those areas and do whatever it takes to be healthy, whether he ever changes. Mm-hmm. Okay? But right now your focus is on you changing him, thinking it's God changing him, and it's really you. Right. Okay. You need to be healthy. But the ir- irony is that if you pull it off, that will be the biggest confrontation on him for having the problem because, see, right now he gets to have the problem and everybody else gets to have the pain and consequences of it and, and then don't scratch your head wondering why he hasn't changed. He doesn't have to change. Right. But if everybody around him gets well, that's a confrontation on, on that. And then you'll stop helping things you don't agree with. Which changes the family system. Right, and right. makes his problem his problem. Makes the family system healthy where it was sick before because they got sucked in it. Now the family system is healthy. And that makes his problem his problem. And when his problem becomes his problem, the odds go up to get better. Because right now he gets to have the problem. You get to have the pain and suffering. Okay. Yeah. Well, here's the big question. Is it possible for that person that we love so much that is so tormented by this addiction, is it possible for them to get well completely well? Sure. Well, yeah. Well, you say that, but there's a lot of the programs that get them there well, well that, that insist that they continue to call themselves an addict. Well, yeah, because, because um, the thing about wellness is not just not about, it's not just about not using anymore. Okay. It's about healing. It's about uh, life style. Mm-hmm coping mechanisms, quality of life. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I call myself an addict in recovery. Okay. Because if I ever ask substances to do for me what I used to ask them to do for me, they will. So I don't ask them to do that. I see. Okay. So when we leave here today, I could say, well, when we get back to the hotel, I'm going to have one drink. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I'm going to stop. And I would believe I could do that, but I would believe that w- whether I could do that or not. Okay. So I'm not going to do that. 
right. like that. Because if I do that, then the next time that you you know come pick me up, I'm going to steal your car or something like that. So. Mm-hmm. So, that to happen. so the key is not to just to get them or, or for them to abstain from the drug that right. they're addicted to. It's for God to work on them internally. What's, on, what's underneath all that and what's inside of that? If you want people sober, mm-hmm. just kidnap them and lock them in a closet. If it's alcohol or benzos, make sure there's a doctor in the closet too, though, because so, they're going to have a dangerous withdrawal. But then at, at the end of 10 days or whatever, however long, right. they're not using. Right. And nothing is solved. Right. That's what recovery is about. So the person can be set free, free indeed. Well, yeah. And see, the thing, the thing is that, you know, even Alcoholic Anonymous talks about God as you understand him, you know, higher power, God. Right. Okay. And that's one of the objections the church has. AA does not promise to lead people to Jesus. If you hold it accountable to do something that it doesn't even promise to do, it won't do it. Wow. But... AA has sent a lot more people to the church than the church has sent to AA. That's interesting. Okay. And, you know, those who don't like it that AA says God as you understand them, what person in your church or even in the viewing audience, what, which one of you does not have a relationship with God as you understand them? Mm-hmm. Everybody who has a relationship with God has a relationship with God as they understand them, but we don't want to give permission for wow. alcoholics to do that. Wow. What we need is three more hours, <laughs> which we don't have. But I want to make sure that everybody knows about these incredible books. <clears throat> this is a book, Families Where Grace is in Place. This was the first uh, book of Jeff's I read. Just It will change your concept of family systems. I encourage you to get that. And then also The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse. Uh, a topic that's very important today. I would encourage you to go to his website. You see the information on the screen there. Jeff, thank you, thank you, thank Thanks you for, for helping us talk about this huge topic. And I pray that uh, the Lord would take this information that you've received today and do something in your life. Don't just hear. Don't just read. Ask God to give you wisdom. James 1, 5. Ask him. He'll give it to you. To, to, to get to the, the, the health and wholeness that he intended you for, for uh, from the beginning. I also want to say thank you to TCT. encourage you to support them. Uh, you can write them at TCT, P.O. Box 1010, Marion, Illinois, 62959. So until next time, our prayer for you is to get the help you need. We love you, and I'm so glad that you joined us today. God bless you. Thank you.